Hey folks, welcome. Welcome to Earth Sky. And check this thing out. This is the local bubble. It's a thousand light year wide cavity. And right in the dead center of it, we're going to zoom in here. That little yellow dot, that's you and me. That's the Earth. That's the sun. But today we're going to be talking about this big thing. This is EOS. This is a vast, enormous cloud of molecular gas. And it was discovered by a team at Rutgers University. And today we've got Jack Hughes. He is the director of Jack. Welcome. He is the director of the physics and astronomy department at Rutgers University. And he's going to tell us what we are looking at this thing, what's been discovered and how far away is it? Jack, welcome. Hi, Dave. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be on Earth Sky. Um, hey, and we are so proud to have you. And I'm, I'm happy to be talking on behalf of one of our top astrophysicists, Blakesley Burkhardt, who made this discovery of this EOS cloud. Now, this is a cloud of molecular hydrogen. Now, molecular mm -hmm. hydrogen is uh, two hydrogen atoms that have bonded together to make what we call H sub 2. Mm -hmm. And EOS is in many ways a, a remarkable discovery because we only see it so far in this hydrogen molecule emission. Most wow. of, and yeah, so most of these clouds we see using other molecules, but in this case, this is the first time we've been able to find a cloud, a molecular cloud that we discovered through the molecular hydrogen emission. Okay, and how big is this thing exactly? Give us a sense of our scale here. Okay, so uh, on scale, it's about um, 300 light years. Uh, 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 no, let, let me correct that. It's about 150 light years across. Uh -huh. And um, it's, uh, if we were to able to see it in the sky, this is an, an artist's rendering of what it would look like if we could see the emission in the sky, it would cover something like 20, 20 degrees. And that's 40 times uh, the width of the of the full moon shown there as full well moon. and so when i teach my undergrads uh, i give them actually a very handy tool for estimating the sizes of things mm -hmm. in uh, that they see on the sky and so for example if you were to put your thumb out at arm's length that would just about cover the moon so that's about a half a degree oh, now okay. eos if we could see it we can't, we can't, it emits in the far ultraviolet, but if we could see EOS, it would expand to be about as big as the width of your fingers here at arm's length. So That's I do that all the time in trying to help people understand the sizes of things in. Okay. Uh, in so when, if we're hanging loose, hanging then we're loose. talking about 20 to 25 degrees. Correct. Of okay. And that's how big it would be. And if you just do that, if you go out at night and you just put your arm out like that, and you can see just how big that area would be and how visible and obvious it would be if it were in our night sky. Yeah. And remember, folks, we're all proportionate. So this works for everybody, no matter how tall you are. Pretty much. Yep. No matter who you are, this will work for you. So this, how far away is this thing, Jack? How, it's from about Earth? Three, how far away from us is it? It's about 300 light years away from us. Okay. And so you said it's not glowing in the visible light is that what made it dark we you know we didn't find the extent of this thing until now until this paper so is that why it's dark and is it the only one we know of that's hanging around out around us this is the first discovery of such um a dark as it were molecular cloud uh in our vicinity or even in our solar in our uh, galaxy as of now um the um, the reason why it's dark is because although hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe and hydrogen molecules like we see in EOS are the most common type of molecule, the emission from hydrogen molecule, because they're exactly the same atoms combined together, they don't radiate light efficiently. Right. So, but if you have carbon and oxygen, oxygen is a little bigger than carbon, that actually does radiate well. And so usually we found these clouds by looking for the carbon dioxide emission from them. Okay. Oh, All right. Sorry, it's yeah. carbon monoxide. I should monoxide, right. It's CO. It's CO, not CO2, but they're, 
quite similar. Anyhow. And, and so this is the first time we've seen a cloud, a molecular cloud in this uh, light that comes from molecular hydrogen. So it, it, it really is a very, um, it's a very important discovery and, uh, and also very um, unusual and exciting. Yeah, I'm excited about it. And I, I kind of need you to describe the local bubble for us. And, you know, give us an anatomy lesson of this thing. I know it's a thousand light years wide and we're somehow right in the middle of the thing. Uh, Where is EOS? Is it on the edge? Is it in the middle with us? Because there are other stars in, in the bubble with us. Tell us about that, Jack. Can you do so, that? So there's, there's evidence uh, for us living in a bubble. We call it the local bubble. And the evidence is that um, the evidence suggests that this bubble is lower density than elsewhere in the galaxy and also hotter temperature. And so we, we, we believe that the, um, um, or we think that we understand how it formed. It would have been a succession of several supernova explosions that produced this hotter, lower density gas. Uh, and, and we just happen to be living hmm. within that. Um, are we directly in the center? Probably not. It's actually very difficult to, uh, to get a very good understanding of uh, the local bubble because when we look at it, we see not just the bubble, but we see everything that's further away than, from us than it. And so it really mm -hmm. requires quite special skills um, and, and real care in trying to, a trying to be able to map the, the local bubble. Okay. Well, and, that leads and me into the question of, I'm sorry, please continue. Don't I, let me I interrupt. Just sorry. Quickly. So, so there are actually various, there's a couple of different interpretations uh, or, or ideas about how big the, the uh, local bubble is. Um, and so, you know, there's still a lot of research that we could do to kind of try to nail that down. And having all the information we do now for EOS means we're actually able to get an understanding of where EOS is and how it relates to the edge of the bubble in that particular region. Let's map our local area. And so that was actually where I was going next is why are we only finding out about it now? And, you know, it is, it's part of our celestial neighborhood. This is very close by cosmically speaking. So was there an advance? Was there a change in the way we looked at the data? How come now? How come now? Well, the data that formed the basis of the discovery was was um, obtained um, by a, a Korean team who had built a special type of imaging spectrograph for the far ultraviolet, and they mapped much of the whole sky uh, from orbit on a Korean satellite. And this was back in the mid 2000s. Um, and so this data was published and um, it um, there was, you know, and they were, the team was continuing to research what they were finding in the bulk, in the uh, in the data set, and uh, around the same time, uh, in the last few years, um, Blakesley Burkhart has been focusing on trying to uh, understand star formation, um, and uh, that leads one to look at molecular clouds, and she uh, was also involved in a NASA mission. She was a key science lead on a NASA mission to try to use far ultraviolet radiation to search for star forming clouds. <laughs> That's and, fascinating. And so when the data from this Korean satellite went public in 2023, it was something that she wanted to look at. And she was able to identify uh, this cloud by just studying the data and looking for its prominence in the data. So we should expect more, more uh, cartography, stellar cartography, I guess, is what we're doing here. Almost in a sense, right? Exactly, exactly. And, um, and, but, and when you find a new feature, you get to name it. And you've called this one, or she did rather, EOS. Tell us true. who EOS is. Tell us what the connection there is. I love this. Well, it's a, um, it's a connection to uh, Greek mythology. Um, because Eos was the goddess of dawn. And in some ways, we're looking at the dawn of stars through star uh -huh. formation. And so it, it's kind of a very nice, I think it's a nice connection. And also, mm -hmm. it connects to the NASA mission that Blakesley was, invol was involved in, which was also oh. called Eos. So Double plus cool. That's, that's awesome. It. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, that is what, what, you know what, what else is cool? What else is cool about this that I didn't ask you about? Tell us, cause this is super exciting for me. I'm just, you know, I'm a NASA guy. I eat this stuff all up. Tell me more, please, Jack. Tell me what is cool here. Well, I mean, um, I'm very interested in the way it was discovered um, through this far ultraviolet fluorescence radiation. And I grew up in the 60s, and there was a lot of tie-dye in those days, and there was also a lot of fluorescent paint that you would use in your, in your bedroom, right? Yeah. Anyway, fluorescence is um, it, it's a material. Uh, in this case, it's mo hydrogen molecules. But in the case of paint, it's a special kind of paint where it's, uh, it absorbs the radiation, and then it's able to release that radiation over time. That's what the fluorescence is. The fluorescence is that you are able to excite the molecules or the atoms. And it, with a certain relaxation time, the radiation comes out later at a different wavelength or frequency. And so in the case of EOS, the uh, wavelength that does the uh, radiation is even further of uh, far ultraviolet radiation. Um, and that then uh, excites transitions electronic transitions that then radiate the fluorescent light that we see speaking of it radiating it, eos isn't going to last forever uh the paper says maybe 5.7 million years from now it'll be gone right is this a star forming region are we going to get stars out of this where's the where's it going to go is it, we don't we don't know so tell us what we think we might know How well so the the estimate we have for star formation is that there's not much going on. But I think that's an area for future research. Uh, and I believe Lakesley has a paper she's submitted to the archive and maybe to, oh. probably to a journal where they look at another data set, the Gaia data set, to look for evidence of star formation that would have gone on in EOS. And uh, they're able to set limits on how much there is. So trying to find the actual star formation that may have gone on in EOS in the past I think that's an area of research that will be pursued going forward. Cool. So I talked about the excitation of the rate of the, uh, the fluorescence. Yeah. Now, and I mentioned that there's some radiation that's coming in from beyond EOS, which is from stars and other radiation that just exists in our galaxy. That yeah. is what's okay. causing the emission we see in the far ultraviolet radiation, but it oh. also has a deleterious effect that same radiation can take the hydrogen molecules and split them, split them apart to dissociate them. Okay? Mm -hmm. And in terms of the molecular cloud, as we dissociate more and more of those hydrogen molecules, we have less and less molecules. And hence, that's the idea of the death of the EOS cloud, the EOS cloud, is that oh. in time, because the rate of disassociation of the molecules is faster than the rate at which they're being produced, we think all of the molecules will ultimately just be dissociated and the cloud will, in that sense, sort of dissolve and not exist as a molecular cloud. In a sense, it's going to blow away in the cosmic wind. Exactly. I mean, but that's interesting. And, and let me tell you. That what is I interesting. And that's something else that we'll be looking at. And speaking of blowing away in the cosmic wind, Jack, we've been at this for quite a while. And I really, really thank you for coming and visiting with us and giving us incredible insight to right here where we live, sort of. It's our backyard anyway. Um, I'd love to have you back, Jack, or uh, <laughs> any other members of your team, because we're going to see a lot more about this. Anyway, folks, don't forget Great. to like, don't forget to subscribe. Jack, thank you. Thank you, Dave, for having me. Oh, it was so kind of you to be here. Folks, it's one earth and it's one sky. First guy, thank you for joining us today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.